Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Influential Motherhood Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Duncan, and as a mom and lawyer, I want to be a cheerleader for moms who don't want to give up their own goals and dreams. Around here, we celebrate moms who are making a difference and talk about ways to juggle work, motherhood, goals, faith, self-care, and more. I'm so glad you're here. The only filters we use around here are coffee filters, so pour yourself a cup and enjoy the show. On today's episode of Influential Motherhood, I am here with Laura Foote, who is a photographer and mom and former Disney princess. I love that um, that is a part of your story, and I can't wait to talk about all of your professional journeys so far. And then we're also going to have Laura tell us some tips for families and for moms as we enter the holiday season, and people are going to be doing family pictures, so she's going to give us some tips for some great family pictures. So, Laura. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. So why don't you start out? Tell us a little bit about you and uh, your family, and then we'll kind of get into your professional journey. But just let tell us a little bit more about you because you're a mom, and um, and I know a little bit about your story with your husband. So give us a little bit of information about who Laura is. Sure. Um, well, I currently call Tampa, Florida home, but I am from the Midwest and my husband and I are high school sweethearts. Are you, you're married to your high school sweetheart, are you? Yep, I am. So rare. Love it. Days. I know. Yes. I know. We had quite a journey in college, but he is still my high school sweetheart. Um, and so Kansas is where we're from. We've been in Florida for about six years. Our family is all over the country. And I think that's, that's, that's just been really kind of important to our family story as we've Mm -hmm. been away and, um, you know, starting our family away from people and in a part of the country that we didn't necessarily grow up with ties to. Uh, so that's a little bit about kind of where we are. My husband's name is Jordan. He's a theater teacher by day and a professional actor by night. So actually like five minutes ago, I was like, please, when you get home from your show, walk in the door quietly. And, um, funny. Yeah, we definitely do kind of the artist life schedule between my business and his work, which is is really neat. We we joke that we're artists that get to have like a driveway and a backyard. Yeah. Um, yeah. which has been a really fun balance. And we also both have education backgrounds. Um, so maybe we can talk about that later. But yep. um yeah, I do coaching and photography full time, but then have a whole different background. And we always wanted to be parents. We actually picked our daughter's name when we were 17 at a Barnes and Noble oh, date, uh, senior it. year of high school. So um we have a pretty interesting parenting journey. We actually took custody of our next door neighbor here in Tampa mm-hmm. in 20, uh, 2016. We took custody of her and she was 17 years old and we were 27 years old. Wow. Um, so I call that journey parenting backwards. Yep. And that was really basically getting through her senior year of high school as I was pregnant with McCartney, who was born the day that our foster daughter graduated from high school. Oh, my so goodness. So quite a journey. Uh, we had one young man from the neighborhood live with us for a season in the fall after that. Um, so in total, we've yeah basically had two teenagers in our care that have called us kind of mom and dad for a season and um, siblings of our first foster daughter that we were involved with for a while. And now we have Max. So that's a little bit about our family. It's it's I colorful. It. <laughs> I love it. Well, I love the story. And um, I remember when I first found you online a couple of years ago and you're posting about parenting backwards. And I thought, what does she mean? And then I, fi- I finally kind of, you know, followed the stories for, lo- you know, long enough to kind of figure it out. And I thought, that's really incredible that, um, you know, that you have this part of your story and that you have served you know, families and children who have that need in your community. So we can talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, so you, as I r- understand it and remember, you started out thinking you wanted to be in higher ed. Is that right? Yeah, that's where I started in the nonprofit world. My bachelor's okay. degree is in marriage and family therapy. Um, mm-hmm. And so that was, I came out of that program and I started work in the nonprofit world and had always been kind of 
between nonprofit and higher ed, even as an undergrad, um, and ended up back in higher ed and very quickly realized I needed a master's degree, which was something I always wanted, but I had really wanted to go the counseling route. And that's actually what brought me to Florida was getting my master's in curriculum and instruction with an emphasis in counseling. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I was actually a faculty member and an advisor, and I've worn a lot of hats on college campuses yeah. uh, right up until I took my business full time three years ago. Wow. Wow. So I don't, I don't know if you know this about me, but I am uh, uh, in higher ed at a law school. And so I thought, I, are, are you an assistant dean? I am an assistant dean. I thought yes. so. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I oversee career services and student life and um, it is a, in my wheelhouse. I love it. I know. <laughs> I know. I know that you're into strengths finder um, yes. as am I. And, and we can talk about that too. But, um, you know, higher ed is like a, it's a different world from, you know, a lot of other industries and and it's such an invigorating place. So I can completely see how that is, you know, something that you really wanted to kind of lean into and and pursue. So tell us kind of where um, where the the left turn, you know, uh, happened, and and then you started kind of down this unexpected route, right, towards photography, right. Yeah. So I'm very, um, personality wise, I'm very strategic, pretty black and white would not Mm -hmm. consider myself creative or a risk taker and have been that way since I was a kid. So, I mean, I picked my college degree as uh, I think a junior in high school, I never wavered. I was the only one who graduated with that degree in my class who hadn't (laughs) changed from another major. I mean, I just did not fit like the, I'm going to figure myself out. I'm going to, and I'm not, I think that is so healthy. I think I am weird and rare. Um, and sometimes I wish going back that I could have had more of that exploratory journey. And those are the students I ended up serving the most directly in, in my higher ed career. But, Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I I actually, to tie in Disney, I did a Disney internship at a point in my college career where I was just really burnt out. And that internship really kind of transformed this very strategic Excel spreadsheet type brain into, okay, Laura, the way you think through things is very systematic, but here's a company that does it as well, very systematically. That's how they pull off what they do every day. Um, And here are some like amazing kind of creative touch points that you're going to learn um, about what it looks like to be able to kind of repeat customer service behavior and really get to know people, you know, deeply in Mm -hmm. this role. And so I came back and actually, you know, I had documented everything on my little uh, point and shoot during that internship and came back and bought my first SLR and very quickly just had people that were like, ready to have me take photos. So basically as a senior in college, I started my business. It's crazy, but it, the 10 year anniversary of my business is next month. Oh, Um, congratulations. Thank you. So it really, it always ran alongside my career. I thought it was great. I loved the outlet. I loved how it connected me with people. I have a background in musical theater, but I knew that performing long-term was way too stressful for my personality type. And that's not something that's easy to do as a hobby. And so I felt good. I'm like, I'm going to graduate from college and I'll have this other thing that can kind of keep me energized, especially Mm -hmm. in the human services field. So yeah, the business just came alongside as I would switch jobs and move and got married and moved again and went to grad school. And I don't think I ever realized it was basically ballooning. So I would work somewhere for a year or two and settle in and the business would balloon. And then I'd up and move for a job or for grad school. And then the business would do that again. And I don't think I realized that it was doing that. I think I thought I'm just okay. And I love it. And it's fun to do on the side. And, you know, especially when we were newlyweds and even in grad school here, um, you know, it just gave us some extra income as both of us were in a lot of career and academic transition. And, I just never, I just never really had my head around being an entrepreneur. Again, that free falling kind of world (laughs) did not feel comfortable for me. And I liked that I had walls and an office and a title and a name tag and letters behind my name. Um, And so it was really hard. I actually, you know, I had an incredible professional team that I was working with in 2016. I had incredible students. I was a faculty member for a course that was all about kind of discovering your career path and unpacking everything from career inventory to life application. So I'm doing all this work with these students and watching them come alive. And basically they band together and came to my office and said, 
we're kicking you out of this university. You've oh got to go goodness. do this. <laughs> and my boss was behind them and everyone was behind them. And I have a video literally of like a boardroom table full of my higher ed colleagues oh, just clapping awesome. me, clapping me off campus. So I was terrified. We had just yeah. taken taken custody of Kay and then actually found out we were pregnant a couple months later. Um, and, and still a lot of days when I wake up, I'm, I, you know, I have a background and a career that I love that I still get to do a lot of work in and someday I hope to return to. So that's yeah. kind of the left turn that maybe never was a full left turn, but definitely I think is where I'm supposed to be right now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just, you can tell that, you know, the stories that you're able to share through your photos and, the connections that you've made, it's, I mean, it's definitely, there's no question from the outside looking in that that's where you're supposed to be, you know, um, but I, I can see how that was scary um, and again, kind of against the grain for you if, if those types of, um, I guess, you know, jumps were not in your kind of automated, you know, automated way of, of going through life, you know, to, right. to just leave a good job and, um, and become an entrepreneur is, is scary, no matter kind of what your personality is. So, um, so that's great. So going back to Disney real quickly, because I know, um, when I first heard this about you, I was like, she was a Disney princess. I don't think it matters how old you are. When you hear that someone was a Disney princess, <laughs> all the hairs on your arms stand up and you're like, okay, I got to hear more. So tell us just very briefly about be, be, your experience being a Disney princess. And then I want to ask you maybe the biggest thing that you learned while you were working at Disney. So I started at the Bippity Boppity Boutique in Cinderella's Castle doing hair, makeup, and nails for little girls that come there to experience a princess transformation. Oh, and that. that was what my college internship was in. Mm -hmm. Um and I loved that role. Honestly, that was my favorite role. And that was where I unpacked so much that I still talk about professionally with a lot of groups and conferences that I'm invited to speak at. Um, because that was really where all of this connected, this idea of systems and processes, but also really meeting people in the moment of life that they're in and creating an experience that's memorable and special for them. That's not just a blanket, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because I had the counseling background or because I was in that type of a program, they allowed me to work with Make-A-Wish families. So that was incredibly oh, powerful. Incredible. And that was really a huge takeaway for me as a stressed out, perfectionistic, high achieving college student to work with these families and to realize sometimes you get to just do what you're supposed to do in the moment that you're supposed to do it and it changes somebody's life and that is a gift and we don't always get to know when those moments are but a lot of times in that role um you know, there was a return of just hearing their story and knowing what they were walking through and how special even that 30 minutes in the castle was to them. So that role was really amazing. And while I was there, like I said, I had a musical theater background. So I ended up at a cast member audition, much to my chagrin, because I purposely was avoiding having to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's an intense process. Um, I was cast and I came back and did that on a summer contract. And it was, as I fondly say every week when I'm at the parks with my daughter under my breath, watching the characters in motion, the hardest job I have ever done and will never do again. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm, what, was, I'm, what, what was the hardest part about it? Well, for every face character, which is a character that has a human face that's showing to the public, you have mm -hmm. a fur character that is also assigned to you. Okay. And in order to kind of get the privilege of training as your face character, even if you have very high audition marks, you have to get through the fur character training. And all of the fur characters for princesses who are average height, the fur characters are very odd because most of the fur characters in the parks are either very short or very tall. So with the okay. princesses being an average of like five, 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 six, they basically had to come up with a line of fur characters for us to be assigned to. And mine were super difficult, like some of the most cumbersome, heavy weighted costumes, um, in the park and just, I mean, I, I remember telling them you should have had me working with a physical trainer for like six months before coming and doing this in the heat of Florida summer, where yeah. if it rains even a little bit, you still stay on set. Um, and then just when I was in her role, the pressure to, I mean, everything from like my pinky positioning to 
my verbiage to the tone of my voice and the pitch of my voice. Someone is off stage watching everything. And so again, for a perfectionistic, detailed, systemized person to mm-hmm. try to perform at that level all day long, it was really hard for me mentally because yeah. I couldn't just get out of my head. Whereas it felt like a lot of the other girls just went on set, did whatever and came off. Yeah. But I was so like thinking everything through that I constantly was getting notes <laughs> to like laugh more. That was yeah. always a note. Laura, just giggle more. And I couldn't do it. There was too much going on. So. And so which princess were you during that time period? Can you friends say? Friends with, yeah. Cause we have to pre- preserve and protect the magic. So I was okay. very good friends with Sleeping Beauty. Oh, who oh, was my favorite yes. growing up. And this was before, you know, there's been an onslaught of new Disney movies in the last 10 years. Right. I actually have not seen any of them, which is crazy, but I'm going to let my daughter introduce me because I'm so classically trained by the company that mm-hmm. the original girls are my wheelhouse. Um, yeah. and I don't even think I, as I've been taking McCartney to Disney, I can't find her in my normal spots. So I'm not even sure what that role looks like now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I bet you um, found out just so much about the magic of Disney while you were there. That's pretty incredible. Um, yeah. And and how neat that you can take your daughter back there now, you know, and and probably appreciate so much of what you see um, about, you know, the Disney magic and, and the systems that they have in place. That's, mm-hmm. that's awesome. Wow. OK, so um, as we think about, you know, the, the, all these parts of your journey. Um, I, what I love hearing is that even throughout, you know, these professional changes and, um, just the unexpected things that have come your way, like fostering, I can hear you kind of referencing strengths finder, you know, and talking yes. about the fact that you are not, you know, uh, the, necessarily the, um, kind of impulsive kind of, cr- uh, I don't want to say creative, that's not the right word, but, uh, you know, that that kind of mentality that you're very into systems and mm-hmm. um, way, ways of being things being just right. So can you give us, um, because we've referenced this a couple of times, a brief definition and overview of strengths finder so that people know what we're talking about and then tell us how people can um, find out more about it and kind of use it in their own lives. Sure. So Strengths Finder is an inventory that was developed by the Gallup organization as kind of the forefront of the positive psychology movement. And it looks at a 34 talent kind of list, if you will, that we all carry. So these are traits that we all carry that are identified and named and defined. Mm -hmm. And then the inventory breaks down those talents into kind of a top five and a top 10 with research backing the idea that any investment we make in talents that fall outside of that top 10 will likely never create the product of an investment made in a talent that's occurring naturally in one of those top 10 spots. So it's really, really helpful. Um, The 34 strengths break themselves into four domains, influencing, executing, strategic thinking, and relationship building. Mm -hmm. So for everything from trying to understand how your spouse is thinking through what they're thinking through or why they do what they do to choosing, um, you know, new people to work on your team or, you know, anything like that. It's just a really helpful inventory for providing language around kind of what we already have. And I think especially in a world where it's so easy to feel like we're not enough or we're just deficit, 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 we end up working and focusing energy and time and resources on the wrong things. It really has an opportunity to refocus and say, hold on, you've got the tools here. Um, to do this. So you can purchase books. Um, they, the strengths has a great website and there's a whole library of strengths in parenting, strengths in business, strengths, just basic. And those all come with a code and that access code allows you to take the inventory online. You can also just buy the inventory online. Um, and they have some different options depending on if you want your top five or your full list. And I do one-on-one coaching in my business. If you just go to laurafoot.com backslash education, I do one-on-one coaching. I conferences bring me on to do onboarding for their attendees. Um, and I've actually started doing a group coaching program that I'll offer again, hopefully this fall. And again, in 2020, that really just brings women and men together under the umbrella conversation of talent and ability and how to focus on the things we want out of life and business through that lens yeah. really practically. Yeah. 
That's great. And I can attest to the fact that uh, like I'm not I know I'm not as well versed in it as you are because I'm not trained and um, certified in it. But someone on my team is in our our office. And so she had each of us get our top five and then she put together a map so yep. we could see. Um, kind of, you know, where we kind of fill in and where our gaps are as a team. And it was really interesting because um, we we laughed because we were really kind of lacking in the executing (laughs) to place. We thought, well, okay, that's good to know, you know. Um, And so it's really common in higher ed. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's lots of ideas and um, relation, you know, it's all about relational types things. And so um, we have been really intentional, you know, as we've thought about bringing new people onto our team. And um, not that that is, you know, the something that we would, uh, would be a deal breaker, but sure. we are at least now aware, you know, okay, yeah. as a team, we're really relational and I'm the... I'm the um, strategic person. And well, that makes sense because I'm the, you know, the leader of the department. But yep. at the same time, we can't, we have to remember that, okay, if if we're lacking in the executing, um, you know, place and all this, then, then we need to not catch ourselves in a place where we're not, um, you know, really moving forward on all these great ideas that we're coming up with and, and things like that. So it's been really helpful. So um, I hope that people will check out, you know, the information that you have and the opportunities that you have for coaching. Cause I think even, you know, especially for women who are in the professional world, but I would imagine, you know, even those who aren't, like you said, it's, it's all about, you know, just knowing kind of how how you fit into this puzzle of all the relationships that you're in both personally and professionally. So Oh yeah. I gave it to my family one year at Christmas because it just oh, helps awesome. you understand yeah. people. And it's not an invent I mean you can make sense of it, but it is one that I feel like really has value when you've got people to work through it. Like a team, that example of the team grid is exactly the use of those domains. So it's it's really cool. And I think in a culture right now where we're like Enneagram obsessed or looking for numbers and language that describes us, you know, this one has been a around for a while and it's neat to see it come to life. Yes, I completely agree. And there's so much great literature, like you said, that you can use and and supplement, you know, what you learn from somebody else. Right. Um, Great. This is also helpful. Um, I feel like you are just a wealth of knowledge. So (laughs) let's turn to one of your other areas of expertise and let's talk photography. Um, So I love that you, you know, you say that you started out with a point and shoot and, you know, then you are now um, have made this your full time career and you're taking these beautiful wedding and family and headshot photos. And so as I was thinking about wanting to chat with you, I was thinking, you know, I feel like as a non photographer, when I get ready for family pictures, uh, you know, this is something we do not as often as we should, but once (laughs) a year, (laughs) um, you know, because I start thinking about Christmas cards. And inevitably, I feel this sense of stress. And so I thought, let's talk through that, because um, I feel like we can get maybe help some other moms who might be feeling the same way, um, kind of feel better going into their family pictures. So I have a few questions, and I want to be sure that you have a chance to offer any tips, you know, that you might that I might not ask about that you just have as a photographer. Sure. But the first thing that I always think about is, okay, how long do I need to plan for a session? Because inevitably we're, we got to work around naps and snack and lunch Mm -hmm. and food and daylight and sun setting and all these things that kind of come into play. And it's like, well, where is the sweet spot for family pictures? So um, is there a, kind of a best time of day for you as the photographer and B, how long is kind of long enough and good enough to get some really good family pictures? So I would say a standard photographer answer for the time of day is going to be golden hour, which is the hour and a half before sunset. And that just in general is really beautiful light. A lot of times the temperature has dropped, but Mm -hmm. you know, if you're in a place that actually has fall, it's not too chilly or vice versa. If you're in Florida where it's still summer (laughs) during the day, you get the opposite. Um, I also think that 
the morning can be a great time. And if you've got a well-experienced photographer, you know, a, a similar thing is happening in the morning. And so sometimes for families, especially whose kiddos are up early, starting the day when they're fresh mm -hmm. and kind of getting in then can be really helpful. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident shooting at any time of day, but in terms of ideal times and times I'm typically going to push my clients to, those are usually my two options. Okay. Um, your second question was the amount of time for a shoot. And I think it's pretty standard now that a photographer who is ha has any type of family portrait offering would offer, even if it's just as a special once a year, um, a mini session type style, which is usually closer to 20 to 30 minutes. And for me, especially if a family is not trying to do multiple outfits and locations, that is the sweet spot, not just for the kids, but usually for dad. Yeah. <laughs> um, you That's know, the joke, true. the joke is always like there's a hamburger and fries waiting for everyone on the back end of this, yes. especially you, dad. Yes. Hang in um, there. Yes. So, I mean, to me, I'm always amazed even when I have less time than that or if there's a meltdown or weather and maybe I only have 10 to 15 good shooting minutes of how much I'm able to capture. Mm -hmm. So I would say if I have 20 to 30, that is perfect. Okay. Well, that's good. That's not as scary and long and cumbersome as I had kind of conjured up in my mind. Um, right. So that that's really good. So you mentioned um, outfit changes, and we'll talk about outfits in just a second. But is that something that you have typically, you know, had good or, or bad experiences with? Or does it just kind of depend on the family? You know, it really depends on the family. I feel like in general, my families now would rather like do a easy switch between locations or kind mm -hmm. of get two looks into locations versus actually having everybody change clothes. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's new in the last few years because it used to be that family pictures were formal. I mean, I can even remember going to an outdoor styled studio. So it was more, you know, uh, modern, I guess, if you will, than an indoor studio, but still it was like the matching denim and the black shirts and kind of, you know, this whole moment of all of us getting ready. And now that that isn't the trend anymore, I think it becomes less about the clothes and yeah. more about some of the spaces. So I, I don't often have families that are trying to do multiple looks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, um, like you said, you can get such a different look just in location and, and, I, looking back on it, I think our photographers have always kind of pushed us towards, you know, let's try just a couple, couple of different locations rather than thinking about changing the whole look, which I'm fine yeah. with. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. Um, so talking about what to wear, what would you say, um, because I always think about this when I'm planning outfits, and you know, this has kind of become the thing, like, we got to plan our outfits. So yes. um, what what should we not wear when we are going to be taking family photos? So in general, you definitely want to steer clear of anything that has logos or just overly loud, like pattern, color, and anything with words. <laughs> so yes. Let's just start okay. there. Just That's cut good. that from cut that from the clothing. Um, tennis shoes, even on littles, I do not recommend. Mm -hmm. um, just because again, even if we're going for like a casual kind of everyday family look, that is going to take away from just the overall quality of the photos. And if the color is not a color you like, or doesn't exist in your home or like, et cetera, et cetera, you don't want to wear it for your photos, Yeah, <laughs> which yeah. sounds silly, but all of a sudden, like the red shirt that, um, you know, your three-year-old's in love with shows up and there's red nowhere to be found in your house. And those photos are not going to be fun to print and have everywhere. Yeah. I've never thought about that. I'm yeah. I'm not kidding you. I have never <laughs> thought about that. About it's a real thing. It happens. I, like yeah, well, I was walking through the store oh and I goodness. coordinated, and now uh, I don't know. Or uh, the holidays, especially. Yes. You know, we go for like a seasonal color palette, and now there's like plaid in our photos. And again, in Florida, that is really it's unique here. But plaid year round is not at all a thing. Plaid right. in general, we gotta fake it till we make it if we wear it in Florida. So I have to really remind my clients. Let's keep it neutral and classy as much as possible. Yes. So is there such a thing as too neutral in terms of like not having pop, you know, like a pop of color? 
Is that, I mean, I, you know, especially down here, sometimes we'll get people that are on vacation that are, that say we, we want to wear like all white shirts and then mm-hmm. jeans and bare feet. Right. Cause that's been like a beach trend for forever. Yeah. And I don't want that because with white sand and all white shirts, the chances that that's going to photograph not great or pretty high. Right. But it's amazing. You know, when I tell my clients to think about a color palette, usually I have them pick their neutrals. So let's say the neutrals are gray and denim and white, and Mm -hmm. then their pop is shades of blue. Um, you know, all of a sudden you don't have to, you don't have to be matchy matchy because mom can be in a chambray, you know, kind of like denim dress with a fun boot. And, you know, your kiddo can be in like a gray shirt and, uh, like a dark jean, you know, and so you can play with, um, when the colors are showing up where, and just by contrasting as people are standing next to each other, even with a neutral palette, it will help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Is there a limit on how many colors should be in the palette? That depends on your family style and the photographer you're working with. For me, yes, because I just like things. um, I just like things to be like more clean and classic. And so usually two strong colors. Like last year, my family was probably like the brightest thing I shot. And our colors were mustard yellow and then kind of like a fun purpley plum. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was in like a yellow floral dress. So I had a little bit of a pattern and my daughter had like a magenta purple knit hat with yellow jeans um and it photographed really beautifully but I kept the background super neutral our house has some pops of yellow so I knew that it would fit in our house and we don't look out of place at all but if I had done like even a third or fourth color in addition to those two it would have been a lot and I was really intentional about the um you know about the background as well yeah and did you say you took your own Um, so I actually, a lot of years I have a friend who is not a photographer, like manhandle my camera for five minutes because my family, because I was a Disney princess forever and all I did was take pictures. And because my husband's an actor, we're a little ridiculous in front of the camera and our daughter is well-trained. So in five minutes with someone kind of holding a camera, um, we pose ourselves and walk and laugh and it just makes it easier because I can edit them the way I want. And I I don't, you know, I don't want a whole thing always. I have hired photographers before, but um, it's hard. It's hard when it's your art and it's hard when in five minutes, you know, you could get the six images you need. I don't yep. need a hundred. I need six. Yeah. So that's awesome. Good for you. I love that. <laughs> I love that. We'll see how much longer last year we had the dogs in it with a one and a half year old. And I was oh like, I'm impressed with us. This is a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. That, but you know, if she, if you're training her early and you know, she has the two of you to, um, to kind of model after no pun intended, but, right. um, you know, to be able to kind of see how it works, then, Hey, you might be, you know, even the dogs might be onto something. Yeah. So. Everyone. Yeah. It's a family strength. It's like our one gifting area. That's we know awesome. how to get our phone. Taken. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so um, how how can we make it easier on the kids as moms, and easier therefore on the photographer um, as we're prepping our kids, and then actually while we're taking the pictures? Yeah. Um, you know, and it doesn't help the kids on the front end, but be sure that you hire a photographer that really is going to make it fun. That can be hard to decipher from a website, but I always mm-hmm. tell families, don't be afraid to hop on the phone, to give them a little insight of your kids, of what they're into. If they're not already asking those questions on their inquiry form, um, you know, just getting some of those insights to them and asking what their process is and how they're going to direct your family. Those are all fair questions to ask. And I find that when families don't have that information, but they find someone whose style they really like, a lot of times they end up feeling like they didn't have enough direction or they were trying to make their kids smile while they were also in the photos and it can be a really hard balance. So know your photographer and know their approach and make sure it's a good fit for your family. And, um, you know, I think for your kids, it's just like anything that's like going to Sam's club, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're like, I'm in it for the samples, but this is not how I want to spend my Saturday mom. So you're like, okay, cool. We're going to do Sam's club. It's going to be great. You're going to get some samples. And at the end, this is the fun thing. So I always tell my families like, go grab like a burger and fries and have a picnic or go to that movie, do the fun thing that you've been wanting to do as a family. You're going to be dressed. You're going to be out and about. The kids will be looking forward to that. Um, if they know that, you know, I feel like my families are always like, remember ice cream tonight. Like that's what's happening later on. So I think having an incentive, 
not just to bribe them, but also to really create a family experience out of it. And the idea that your kids are going to look back and say, I always remember I have one family that does this. They go to ice cream and then they go to a hotel the night of their family oh, session. Oh, how fun. And it's so fun. They do like a family getaway, family staycation. And I told them, I'm going to do this when Mac is old enough to understand because I grew up with my parents after soccer games and stuff surprising us and our bags would be packed and we'd go to the hotel for the night. But I think it's so neat that it's like we do this once a year. We get our pictures. We go have ice cream. We get pizza and we go to the hotel. And it's like... This is our annual thing, and yeah. we, we want you guys to grow up with these pictures and these memories. It's so special to me that they do that. I love that. So That's awesome. whether it's an ice cream cone from McDonald's in the drive-thru on the way home or, you know, something bigger, really making it like a fun memory for them. Um, and snacks and water, you know, are huge. Uh, yes. They can be distracting a little bit during the shoot. And so if you really want some details, things like gummy bears or um, fruit snacks, little things that they can like chew quickly mm-hmm. um, that are yummy and might keep them motivated. Single M&Ms go a really long way mm-hmm. as long as they don't get to hold them where they get melty. So Little things like that help because otherwise, I mean, that's mainly for little, little kids yeah. under the age of yeah. three. Um, but yeah, you know, and they get older and like, I'm sure your your kids are this way. It's like, oh, she's making me smile again, you know, yeah. making me pose again. <laughs> but again, I think the right photographer is not going to make them feel like they're posing the whole time. 20 to 30 minutes goes really fast with even a family of four because by the time you do the parents and each of the kids and the kids together and the kids with each parent and the whole family – that's a lot right there, yeah, just those combinations. Um, and if you're in a fun place, I with my families at least, I'm always trying to, hey, let's walk around. Let's check this out. Uh, you know, and so they feel like they're kind of getting to hang out while we shoot. So, you know, I think being intentional about the location and, again, knowing your kids well. There are some kids that have a lot of sensory, um, you know, distraction Um tendencies. And so being in a place with a bunch of people or with a lot going on is going to be hard for them. And if your photographer doesn't know that it's going to be miserable for everybody, Yeah, you know, yeah. or, um, if you have a kiddo that's really shy and you have a photographer that kind of gets in their face right away and doesn't, doesn't know to give them time to warm up that could backfire. And then all of a sudden that kid's trying to hide behind your leg, the whole shoot. So figuring out ways for them to know what they need to know about your family ahead of time um, I think is is really important if they don't have a way when you're inquiring or when you're completing your you know contract and everything to get that information from you. Yeah, yeah, that that is those are all excellent tips and um, and some that I I have never thought of or or never you know even really noticed kind of the intention behind it with our photographers. Yeah. Um, I, the last time we had it done, she had like a bag of Skittles and would kind of you know it was almost like. Like if you had a dog, you know, she would like after every little set, give them a couple of Skittles. And I thought like, OK, that's good. And then she she kept saying, I have a donut for you in my car when we're done. And um, she had texted me beforehand and said, you know, are they are you good with them having a donut afterwards? And I thought, oh, sure. You know, but yeah. her continuing to say that to them, you know, like we're almost done and then you get your donut um, really kept them motivated because they were only five and two at the time and so oh yeah um th- and they did not let her forget it they were like as soon as she was like okay they were like all right where's the donut you know yes um, and she followed through on her promise and they got their donut but um uh, I, I now that I hear you kind of talk through it I really kind of understand the her intention behind it and how important that probably was in getting us through those pictures so yeah um, that's awesome that's it. the mark of a good photographer yeah too, who's really yeah. thinking about the kids yeah, she has twins. So I think she, um, she, you know, it's good to, to kind of know that your photographer is, is comfortable with kids, like you said, um, and not just going to yeah. be out there like a robot, you know. Um, so right. That's great. Is there anything else in your experience as a photographer that you would want to say to moms and to families who are getting ready to have a session with a photographer that would be like a, you know, a good tip for us to be able to prepare? Um, well, this is like maybe a silly one, but I would tell moms just give specifically give yourselves grace. I feel like mm-hmm. my moms are always the one who they've scheduled the shoot. They've worked so hard to like order outfits online and gone to the store and, you know, they're trying to get everybody dressed and they tried to pick the right time of day. They're just always the ones that are like running the whole thing. And simultaneously they might feel like 
I wish I was 10 pounds lighter. I, you know, I, yep. <laughs> I don't, I just feel like, you know, they really get like kind of the back burner of the whole experience and yet they carry the whole thing and are often the yeah. ones who are really wanting the photos. Um, so whether it's hiring hair and makeup artists and just letting that be a splurge that day of they're going to come to your house and they're going to do your hair and makeup and you're going to sit while the kids you know, watch TV or have lunch or whatever so that you have some help in your getting ready, um, getting your nails done, planning that fun family day uh, or thing afterwards. Like doing that, I feel like is really important because the how you feel in your mind is going to really affect the experience. Yeah. And, you know, mom life is just a lot. And I think I can just always see it at my sessions, um, you know, with my mom. So just, just figure out what that one thing is, whether it's you know, the new piece of clothing or another way to kind of treat yourself going into the experience. And, and hopefully you'll be working with someone that's going to make you feel like, my gosh, I got to just like be there. You know, I didn't have Mm -hmm. to like have my mom wife hat on for that whole shoot. Yeah. You can probably see it in their eyes and on their faces. And I feel like kids can pick it up too. Oh, absolutely. You know, that stress. Um, Yeah. And, and I think it's, I mean, a lot of times they're like excited, but I can just tell how, you know, it's a journey. It's not easy. It's not something that you just wake up and pull off right. like good family <laughs> photos. Um, and, and again, I, you know, I just think as women, especially like our roles as moms and having that documented, it's really important. We don't get those back. And, um, you know, a lot of times we're just the afterthought, like we yep. are in a lot of other spots of our yeah. life. So, yeah, that's a great tip. That's a great tip. So as we start to wrap up um, and, you know, I've, we've heard so much about your professional journey and um, just the ways that you've navigated such really neat changes, you know, both personally and professionally over the last 10 years. Um, and congratulations on your upcoming anniversary of your photography business. Thank you. What has become your favorite mom hack? So you've parented now forwards and backwards. Yes. Um, and so as you have kind of embarked on kind of both ends of kind of, you know, the, the, those components of motherhood, what have you learned that um, has become something that you've been able to implement? I learned. Um, gosh, with Kay, really, before Mac was even born, how, for me at least, I just cannot do this by myself. I am not meant to be a one-woman mom show. And and we really didn't have a lot of support. And that decision to bring her into our home was obviously pretty radical. And people just really weren't sure what to do or how to help. But it really made me brave with Mac from – from sitters to leaning into friendships to, you know, thinking about kind of my needs as a person outside of just being in a house with my kids all day and being a shuttle driver. Mm -hmm. Um, That's been really, really huge. And just seeing also how amazing it is to have to build a system and pay for, frankly, a system of people who your kids trust, love, um, enjoy spending time with, learn from that are outside of you has been really powerful for me and really necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I can imagine that, you know, not having a lot of family or having family nearby has really kind of, um, forced, I don't mean force in a bad yeah. way, but like force that upon you. And, yeah. um, and you really had to, to figure that out. So, um, and I, I think I, I've, I've seen you talk about this, that Mac travels with you really well, right? I mean, she. Oh, yeah. That girl's on an airplane like twice a month. Yeah, I love (laughs) it. I love it. I love that she's just like this little, you know, sophisticated little traveler. So, yeah, um, that's awesome. Well, good good for you for, you know, figuring that out and knowing that you need that village to um, whether, you know, even if it's a paid village, you need the village to to be there to help you because you can't do it by yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Laura, for sharing so much valuable information tonight. I feel like um, you're, like I said, just such a a bank of knowledge about so many different things. And um, I hope that we can continue to hear more from you. So tell everybody where they can find you. And um, you mentioned your your StrengthsFinder education um, component of your website, but tell us about your photography business and where we can find you um, for that. And, and I know you're on Instagram, so give us all of that information. 
Sure. So just remember Laura Foote. And if you type that in, it'll get you to me from any platform. So mm-hmm. I'm Laura Foote on Instagram. With an E on the end. <laughs> with an E. Yeah, Foote yeah. with an E. Um, and so I like to show up on stories and kind of hang out and chat. And my feed is a total mix of life and business. And I like it like that. I don't want it to just be portfolio land. And then my website, laurafoot.com is everything from a same same photography to coaching to upcoming speaking engagements. Um, I try to keep things there as well. So those are probably the two primary places. Great, great. And you do a lot of kind of traveling mini sessions. Is that right? So yeah, we're on the road a lot in general. So I mean, wherever you live, the chance that I could end up there in the next however, like six months, I mean, I, I think next month alone, I'm shooting in like seven different states. So constantly on the go. And anytime I travel, I love to meet friends and Instagram's been just a beautiful place um, for people to say, we want to meet you or come, come hang out with our family and take pictures and let's go to dinner. And it's been so fun to do that. So I truly feel like I have friends and clients all over. Yeah, that's great. I love what social media can do. Yes, it can, it can be a good thing. So, um, well, very good. Well, thank you, Laura, again, for such great information tonight. And I hope that um, those who are listening can catch you on one of your trips. Uh, we have a big North Carolina audience. I know you come here. So, um, yes, I'm in Raleigh almost every other month. Yeah, so. I, I, I'm going to try to we're, we're going to talk about that when we hit stop recording. <laughs> I'm going to try to catch you on, on one of your next trips. So yes. um, thank you again, Laura. And I hope that everybody can um, catch you on the road one day. So Thank you again. Thank you. I'm so thankful for the moms who share their stories on here on the show and in our fun Instagram community. I'd love for you to connect with me online at Influential Motherhood on Instagram and Facebook to continue the conversation or just say hello. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five star rating and a written review in the Apple Podcast app. It's how you can help get the show in front of moms looking for episodes just like this one. I hope you'll find a way to influence your work or community for good this week. Don't forget, you can listen to other episodes or learn more about the show at www.influentialmotherhood.com. See you next week.